Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me again. I'm Rene Nacheran, the Director of Public Health for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and the editor of the History of Vaccines Project. With me today here is Jonathan Jerry, Science Communicator at the McGill Office for Science and Society. You can follow him on Twitter at Crack Science. He is also the co-host of the podcast Body of Evidence. And uh, Jonathan, I came up on your article on something that we have all been taught in epidemiology school. Public health students get taught all the time in their Epi 101 courses is that Edward Jenner, in searching for a cure or a preventative for smallpox, came upon these wonderful milkmaids, these beautiful young women who were not scarred from smallpox, because after getting smallpox, many people would get scars on their face. And that's how he put two and two together, that cowpox would prevent smallpox. You have evidence to the contrary, or rather evidence that kind of <laughs> dispels that myth. Can you talk to us a little bit about it? But it is a beautiful story, isn't it, right? He came across these nymphs, these elven ladies who had escaped from the pitted scars of smallpox, and that's how he put two and two together. And that's how he figured out that a prior exposure to cowpox gave you immunity against smallpox. It's a beautiful story. It is completely false. Now, I have come across some apocryphal origin myths and science where you're not quite sure where it comes from. Is it true? Is it false? Is there a little bit of truth? But in this particular case, we know it is a lie, but it is interesting because it really simplifies a much more complex story. And before we had vaccination, we had inoculation or variolation. This is a, an intervention that was essentially created by a lot of different people all over the world a very long time ago. And this was because of smallpox, right? So smallpox is a very old scourge. We've been dealing with it for thousands of years. We now know that it is caused by the variola virus and the major strain of the virus gives you smallpox and it would kill nearly one in three people who caught it. And the people who would survive would often have these pitted scars on their skin. Sometimes it would even lose their sight. And so smallpox was all over the world and people had this idea for variolation, which consisted in taking a little bit of a smallpox pustule that somebody had because they were infected and giving it to somebody else either through cuts in the skin and putting the material there, or the Chinese would use a long pipe and they would blow it up somebody's nose. And so it gave you a much more localized infection. And so people would survive it at a much higher frequency than they would survive an actual full-blown smallpox infection. So that was the standard for many years. And it was brought to England around 1717 by the wife of a British ambassador, Lady Montagu. She mm -hmm. lived in Constantinople. She saw how harmless smallpox was over there because the Turks had adopted variolation. So she brought it to Great Britain. But then it would take about 79 years before Edward Jenner would make the leap from variolation to vaccination. But even there, it's a bit more complicated than that. And, and you mentioned in your article how there were others who had made similar observations or at least were working towards that. And so why is it that we don't hear about them in, in the history of vaccination as much as we hear about Jenner? The reason is because of Jenner's biographer and also because, and we can just look on social media right now, the amount of pushback there is against vaccines, right? This is not new. This has been there since the very beginning of vaccinations. To make a long story short, there was a doctor before Edward Jenner. His name was John Fuster. And this whole story takes place in the West Country of England, which is near the town of Bristol. It's about two and a half hours drive west of London. And so this John Fuser was a physician. He was variolating people in the West Country. And some people would just not develop this blister on their skin following variolation. And he was like, hmm, I wonder why that is. Everybody seems to have the skin reaction after variolation, but some people don't. Why is that? And at some point, somebody who wasn't getting this sign, he was a farmer. And he said, you know what? I've had cowpox before to a violent degree, he said. Mm. And this was the link, right? So it was Fuster with his farmer and not... Edward Jenner and the milkmaid. And so Fuster began to ask other people who likewise had not reacted to the variolation. And they also said, yeah, I've had cowpox before. And so Fuster was part of this informal medical society that would meet at an inn in a nearby town. And so he told the members of this fraternity, basically, hey, here's a strange link that I found. And one of the doctors who was present there, he had a 19-year-old apprentice and his name was Edward Jenner. And oh, so Jenner right. probably heard about this link through his supervisor at the time. He would then go on to London. He would come back to the West Country afterwards. And then he would spend many years trying to figure out exactly what was happening because it wasn't as clear of a link as I've made it out to be because the word cowpox was being used for diseases that were not actually caused by the virus that causes cowpox. And so it took him about you know 25 years to disentangle this whole mess. And then 
when he thought, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do what we do with variolation, but we're going to do it with cowpox. We're going to take a cowpox pustule that somebody has, and we're going to give this to somebody. And then we're going to try to infect them with smallpox. And so he did that, and the cowpox pustule came from a local milkmaid. So there was a milkmaid involved in the story. So he took the biological material from her pustule, and he gave it to this eight-year-old boy, James Phipps. And then he did something that we can debate the ethics of it at the time, but he tried to infect this boy with smallpox, not once, but twice. And as he wrote, no disease followed. And so this was Jenner's first attempt at vaccination, but he was not the first one to do that. There had been a few other people a few years before, including one in Dorset. There was a guy in Kiel in now Germany who had done this, but he was the first one to document his experiments mm -hmm. and to try to get them published. And so to wrap up the story, basically, he tried to say, hey, this is the way forward. We can give people this vaccination using cowpox material. It will give them immunity against smallpox. But there was opposition to it. There was a lot of momentum for variolation. Physicians felt more comfortable with it. The evidence that Jenner had presented was not great at first. And so in order to rehabilitate Edward Jenner's reputation after his death, his biographer, John Barron, actually created this milkmaid myth. So he wanted to reduce the role that Fuster had in creating vaccines and really elevate Jenner as the father of vaccination. And so he completely made up this lie about this observation that Jenner had allegedly made of the beauty of milkmaids mm -hmm. and even said that Jenner told him on his deathbed. He repeated this story on his deathbed. And so this lie, which is essentially propaganda for Jenner, was so successful that we still repeat the story today as if it is true, but it is not true. It was actually just a lie. Running the History of Vaccines project, I have a lot of experience with this myth, with seeing it. And in some instances, propagating it myself, I think we're going to have to take another look at how we have written the story of Edward Jenner, for sure. Do you know of any other similar instances? And before we get to that, I think we need to clarify to people, right? This is an era where viruses are not known to be a thing. The germ theory still hasn't come into its own. And so all of these observations and all these experiments are taking place at a time when there wasn't really a good biological understanding of what was going on. It was more haphazard, right? And so journals were not what they are now, or the knowledge of biology, it wasn't what it is now. And so it was very easy for stories like this to be propagated, right? Absolutely. As I said, he was meeting in an inn with other physicians. That was their conference, their medical conference was like, hey, let's go have a pint at the local inn and we'll chit chat about what we've observed while we've been variolating people. The very first British medical journal was in existence, but it was still a relatively recent phenomenon. And so, yes, we're centuries away from the, the modern science and medicine that we know today. And then back to my original question about if there have been other such medical myths that we still perpetuate today and probably should tweak or clarify. Yeah, one that I'm obsessed with is the origin story of modern placebo research. So you might have heard this story that it took place during World War II. Dr. Henry Beecher is trying to administer morphine to soldiers who are in pain, mm -hmm. and he runs out of morphine. And so what does he do? Different stories will tell it different ways. He accidentally, or he does it on purpose, or a nurse does it accidentally. They end up giving the soldier a saline solution. And the soldier apparently reacts as if he has been given morphine. And this is the light bulb moment for Henry Beecher, who suddenly thinks, aha, there's something interesting here about the power of the mind over the body. And so after the war, he begins this research program into placebo research. I tried my best to track down a firsthand account of this story. There's a journalist who also had access to the Henry Beecher archives at Harvard University, I believe it is. Could not find a trace of it. And when you look at uh, scientific papers that refer to this story, you look at the citations there, it is this garbled mess of people citing each other, all these secondary and tertiary sources. And uh, sometimes they will refer to a paper by Henry Beecher, in which if you read it, there's no mention of this story. There's a lot of really sloppy bibliographic scholarship that is happening around this story. And so it is purely apocryphal. It was very interesting because there is an episode of MASH where a very similar story takes place. And at some point I was like, is this where the myth began? Was this an episode of a very popular TV show that somehow got fused with the story of Henry Beecher? Because in that episode of MASH, there's a potential contamination issue with their stock of morphine. And so they end up scraping sugar off of the donuts that they're serving and they're putting them into pills. So they're literally creating sugar pills, which they're giving out to the soldiers. 
And then they report the following day that maybe half of the soldiers seem to respond to it. And I actually found the writer for that episode, the, the person who actually wrote this episode, still alive today. I managed to reach him via email and ask him, where did you get this story from? And he said, actually, so there were three storylines in that episode. And that particular storyline, I had nothing to do with. I was given the story by a now dead producer who had heard of it from some third party who goes unnamed. So that trail went cold, but I did manage to find an actual academic reference that predates the MASH episode. So that is not where the story comes from. But we still don't have a firsthand account of this stunning story of how modern placebo research got started. So that also sounds like a myth to me and it's still being repeated on websites and encyclopedias and in academic papers all the time and people just don't take the time to try and, and figure out where it comes from because of course they've got other things to do so it becomes this story that nobody questions because it's a good story and it's plausible enough that's the yeah. other thing it's okay yeah i can see that happening and so that kind of just there's no pushback against it because it's a good story and it seems scientifically plausible and you go with it yeah that is fantastic. Thank you so much for writing that article. We'll have it on the section notes on the video. And if you ever come across anything else on vaccines that we need to tweak and we need to correct, please do let us know. And anybody who's hearing this, if you see anything on the History of Vaccines website, that needs to be corrected. I am always open to criticism. Too. And I do want to tip my hat off to Arthur Boylston. He's a pathologist and medical historian. He wrote a two-part expose on the milkmaid myth, which you can find was published in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. The first part is called The Origins of Vaccination Myths and Reality. If you want to dig even deeper into the complex history of how vaccines came about, he did fantastic work in this series. Absolutely. Yeah. Highly recommend it. Again, this was uh, Jonathan Jerry with the McGill Office for Science and Society on Twitter at Cracked Science, also co-host of the podcast Body of Evidence. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for this. And please stay tuned for the next episode.